four hours ago, I got off a plane from Arizona. No, I wasn't exploring the Grand Canyon, nor was I visiting colleges. I was in inpatient treatment for anorexia nervosa, a disease I never thought I would have. When I was younger and I heard the words anorexia nervosa, my mind immediately flashed to an emaciated young woman who simply couldn't eat. How could an individual deliberately starve themselves as they watched their body slowly shut down? It seems so illogical. But in the temperament of someone with an eating disorder, they are anything but illogical. When I was around 10 years old, my mom bought me an American Girl Doll book about puberty. To this day, I have no recollection of anything in the book, let alone my thoughts, with the exception of two pages. These two pages discussed eating disorders, specifically anorexia nervosa, and described the, the surface level symptoms of the disease. Young girls look in the mirror, believe that they look fat, and deliberately starve themselves, which can accumulate in death. Terrified by the prospect of death, I made myself a promise. At 10 years old, I told myself, Peyton, you will never have an eating disorder. Even if you think you look fat, you will always be skinny. Fast forward a couple years later when I was a gymnast practicing around 10 hours a week. I loved food and had no care in the world about what I was eating. Again, when I heard the word anorexia, I would always question, how could someone starve themselves? I love food way too much. After performing gymnastics for 12 years, which was my passion, it all came to an abrupt halt. One day at practice, the weekend before my first meet of the year, I fell off the uneven bars. My bone had popped out of its socket and I was rushed to the hospital to get a CT scan. The CT scan showed that not only had I dislocated my elbow, but I had broken it in three pieces and I had to have surgery. After the surgery, in which I had eight screws and a plate put in, my life seemed to return back to normal. I went back to gymnastics, limited in what I could do, and I felt as if life was once again in my control. After a few months, however, my bone wasn't healing properly, and I had to have another CT scan, which once again showed that I had to have another surgery. In the middle of my surgery, it turned out that my bone had completely died, and it had to be removed. As a result, I could no longer do gymnastics. The physical pain I felt was incomparable to my emotional pain. The one aspect of my life where I validated myself vanished in a moment's time. I was devastated. I felt out of control. I felt as if it were my fault. And when I felt as if I was drowning and couldn't grab onto anything, I grabbed onto the one thing I could control. Food. I spent hours thinking about food. I totaled up calories in my mind hour after hour and day after day. And I took pride in the numbers I saw dropping on the scale. Even if my life was out of control, well, at least I could control what was in front of me three times a day. I thought that restricting my food intake after losing my passion would give me control and give me my life back. But it really ended up just taking both away. It was during this time period that countless friends, family members, and teachers reached out to me, telling me that I looked sick or very skinny. But rather than instilling fear within me, it made me feel accomplished. I was doing something right. Others asked me if I needed help because they were really concerned. I didn't need help. I was in complete denial. After all, I was the healthiest I ever had been. I was eating clean foods, I was exercising, I had a low heart rate. I had just lost muscle from gymnastics. But little did I know that I was the sickest I ever was, not just physically, but also mentally. After countless family members reached out to my parents, they knew there was a problem, but they couldn't exactly pinpoint it. For months, they sat with me in the office asking if everything was okay. Of course, once again, I was doing great. I was always studying so I could have near-perfect grades in every single one of my classes. I was always productive, and I was really, really happy with my body. Eventually, however, my parents decided that I do an initial assessment with Melrose Center, an eating disorder facility nearby. The appointment was made on a whim, 
and no one expected much of it, myself included. After all, I wasn't anorexic. When I looked in the mirror, I didn't look emaciated, and I loved food. How could an anorexic love food? I spent hours watching cooking shows during my free time. I made food for my siblings and myself only just to throw it away. Later on, I would find out that both of these are, in fact, symptoms of starvation. And I was very, very sick. After one initial assessment, I had to grasp the fact that I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, and I was immediately sent to inpatient treatment. Leading into inpatient treatment, I was terrified. I was expecting to meet individuals whose lives solely revolved around their eating disorders. But I couldn't have been farther off from the truth. These individuals that I met were some of the most intelligent, caring, and courageous people whom I have ever encountered. But they, like myself, happen to have struggles with food. But our struggles with food never made us any more or any less human. They just give us racing thoughts of lack of self-worth that no human being should have to feel. I was in inpatient treatment for 37 days, and it was one of the more difficult times in my life. I was ashamed, and I was scared. I felt as if I didn't belong, and I felt as if I wasn't sick enough. Eating disorders are competitive. They love being the best at everything, even if it means being the sickest. They also love numbers. Who ate the least, who can exercise the most, who had the lowest heart rate, and who lost the most. But with an eating disorder, it is never enough. And there is no such thing as rock bottom. During those 37 days, I stared down at my food with anger. I was so angry that it had brought me to this point in my life. I was angry that it had to be so difficult for me. Why wasn't I normal? Why couldn't I simply pick up a piece of food and put it in my mouth while everyone else around me could do it so effortlessly? I was ashamed after having to say I was anorexic. I didn't want it to become my identity, and I didn't want it to make others think of me differently. And to this day, I do still have the same concerns. Eventually, I left inpatient treatment, but I later found myself back at the same building in the beginning of summer. I was readmitted to inpatient treatment for another 14 days because even though I was physically stable, I was far from mentally stable. My eating disorder thoughts were raging. They told me that I looked fat. They told me that I, looked, I was happier when I was skinnier. And they told me that I would never be successful. I was exhausted from not feeling as if I was enough. I wanted to give up. I often told myself that it would be so much easier to just live with an eating disorder. After a few months, my parents decided to cut ties with Melrose Center, and I was later sent to an inpatient treatment facility down in Arizona, where I was for another 50 days. After going through inpatient treatment twice, I felt like a failure. I felt as if my friends and family members would find me weak and think that I could never recover from this disease. And in the midst of my eating disorder, I had broken a promise I made at 10 years old. A promise I made about a disease I knew nothing about. A disease that I thought was in vain. A disease that I didn't think was a mental illness. A disease that I thought had everything to do with food. All of my assumptions were so wrong. Eating disorders are not in vain. They do not discriminate. They could care less about your age, gender, or ethnicity. They just want control. They have everything to do with food, yet simultaneously nothing to do with food. They are the deadliest mental illness ever in the world. And those aren't statistics to be messed around with. And my relationship with food was solely an external reflection of the chaos inside my mind. My eating disorder was a form of validation I could not find anywhere else. It told me I was strong when I felt weak. It told me I was enough when I felt far from enough. It told me I was in control when I felt lost. And it gave me something to hold on to when I felt as if I were drowning. 
My eating disorder was not a choice, nor were the countless thoughts I told myself every single morning I woke up and looked in the mirror. I didn't destroy countless relationships, have every day feel monotonous, lose my passions and isolate myself because I'm vain. I did it because I was hurting. Again, I didn't spend those 101 days in inpatient treatment because I'm vain. I spent those 101 days trying to heal the perfect storm that caused my eating disorder. I spent those 101 days trying to get back the hundreds of days my eating disorder had taken away from me. To this day, I often think about my life if I had never fallen. I often question if I had performed just one move differently, would I have had an eating disorder? I do not know, and that is okay. To be candid, I'm not recovered. I am a work in progress, and that is also okay. In the midst of such questioning, and I ask myself, what if I hadn't fallen? I remind myself that if I had never fallen, I would have never known what it's like to get back up. And I'm getting back up now, which is more than I ever thought I would have done. And I've reached milestones that I never thought I would have reached months earlier. Recovering from an eating disorder is not easy. It is one of the hardest things I've done. It is messy. It is full of tears. And it is exhausting. But recovering from an eating disorder gave me my life back. Something my eating disorder could never give me. And to anyone that is struggling, it is okay to not be okay. You did not choose this disease, nor are you weak. Success is not defined by not reaching out because you think you can handle it and you're strong enough and you're afraid. Success is defined by reaching out when you know you're, you need help. And it is the most terrifying thing to be vulnerable. You are worth more than the calories you eat in a day, the body you see in the mirror, and the negative thoughts that race through your head. These are all facts that I'm still struggling to believe at times. You are not your eating disorder, and your eating disorder is not you. You are enough, even if you think otherwise. Your life is waiting for you, and it wants you to come back. Although I am far from recovered, I know that being cured is not the sole definition of success. Success for me is eating another meal when my eating disorder thoughts are racing through my mind, asking me, did you see yourself in the, morning, in the mirror this morning? Are you really sure you want to eat that? Is that going to make you successful? Success for me is looking away from the mirror when I begin to fixate on my flaws. Success is being open and honest with the ones I love. Success is supporting others along the way as we go through the same struggles that seem to tear us apart. Success is being vulnerable when it is the most scary thing to do. Success is not one final action. It is the accumulation of our actions, big and small, every single day. My eating disorder wasn't a choice, and it never will be. I did not change, I did not struggle every single day to get better. My eating disorder was never and will never be a girl standing in the mirror thinking she looked fat. My eating disorder was never and will never be a girl focusing on every single number. My eating disorder was never and will never be a girl restricting her food intake. My eating disorder was never and will never be my identity. And my identity was never and will never be my eating disorder. My identity is found in my relationships, which I continue to rebuild, my passions, which I continue to pursue, and my morals I hold close. My story is not something for me to be ashamed of. It is something for me to embrace.